The following episode contains approximately 815 spoilers for all seasons and episodes of Lost. You've been warned. Well, hello there. Welcome back to Lost the Plot. It's the show where two Irish lads talk a lot of scutter about the hit early 21st century ABC television program, Lost. My name is Dave, and I'm joined by the IRL birthday boy today. It's Ado. Happy birthday to you. I'm going to just come out there and say it, that it was actually my birthday um, nearly a month and a half ago by the time this yeah goes this out. airs 9th of november we're recording 27th of september but we can talk about it right your boy's 32 i mean sure same birthday as avril lavigne happy birthday today to avril lavigne and happy uh, birthday and to meatloaf who i would have said a very big happy birthday to except he ended up being a bit of a dickhead during the covid pandemic so and also he's dead <laughs> and he's dead so <laughs> meatloaf previously discussed at length on this podcast funny enough do you remember we, that episode we, Oh, ooh, which episode are you talking about? We spoke about Meatloaf. I think it was just after he died, actually. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I grew up listening to Meatloaf. I love Meatloaf. Yeah. I don't know why we talked about his death specifically. There have been a lot more like, I mean, I, do, I love Meatloaf as well as music, but there have been a lot more uh, notable deaths. We, talk, we talked about Meatloaf and Queen Lizzie. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who else has died over the last few months? Yeah, it's been quite enough. That, that, that like Jean Luc Godard died recently. He's like French New Wave director, but he's not like a. I don't think it's a huge mainstream one that a lot of people. Yeah, I know. can't think of a lot of big names that have died recently. Do you remember there was that period? What was it like last year? In like a space of six months, like so many fucking famous people just died. Do you remember the year of 2016? That was relentless. Oh, Harambe, man! <laughs> yeah, 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 dicks out for Harambe. Dicks out. Dicks out. How's your birthday been, man? Okay, so I'm having my traditional birthday drink, which is affectionately referred to as Captain Pepper. And just from its name, you can guess what's in it. It's my birthday cocktail. It's Mm -hmm. Dr. Morgan. No, that's another name for it. (laughs) So Captain Pepper or or Dr. Morgan. It's just got two ingredients. Two plus two equals that drink. You can work Mm -hmm. it out from here. I also for I swear to drunk, I'm not God nor under the affluence of alcohol. (laughs) <laughs> Roy, I've only had tea martinis and the sitter I long here to the drunker I get her I drunk my my brother shout out to Matt he very kindly made me a a rum Arnold this, this evening uh, which is a Tom Arnold but with rum instead of gin and it was pretty good and do you know what he offered me another one he, well he, he, he I was coming up to record the podcast and he's like if I make it another one do you want me to bring it up to you and I said nah you better not because it was on a tight schedule tonight we've got a hard out as the Yanks say yeah, so I, so I told him not to. But then, like, now I feel bad because it's your birthday and you're having a drink. I should have one as well. So, hang on. Tom Arnold is a cocktail, is it? Yeah. I, I might be mixing it up with an Arnold Palmer, but I don't think I am. I think Arnold Palmer is non-alcoholic. I think that's like an iced tea and a lemonade or some shit like that. Uh, I've seen this con a lot. So, Tom Arnold's actually an actor. He's a big Hollywood actor and comedian. I've seen him. Like, he was in Roseanne. Mm-hmm. For a long time, Jackie Ooh. Thomas show. He's the you know what? Show. I was ju- I was just reading an interview with uh, Roseanne Barr the other day, and now and she was talking about Tom Ar- Tom Arnold, and now I'm thinking maybe I got this wrong. Let me check. You are thinking of the Arnold Palmer. Are you sure? I think so. I think that's non-alcoholic though. And wait, um, hang on. What was in the drink you had besides rum? Uh, it was ooh, what was it? My brother made it for me, so I'm not a hundred percent sure. There was like uh. Well, supposedly, Lemon. supposedly the Tom Arnold uh, is made with vodka. Oh, he told me the Tom, Ar- Tom Arnold was traditionally with gin, but you know, vodka they they can be interchangeable in cocktails a lot of the time. So the Tom Arnold's apparently right, half a shot of vodka, one sorry, one and a half shots of vodka. My apologies, and not like you know Midwestern housewife shots. You know, like add two shots. Glug, 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 glug. <laughs> Did you ever see that video? 
Ah, it's fucking wild. I want to want her cocktails. But no, Tom Arnold, apparently, you get one and a half shots of vodka, one and a half shots of lemon juice, freshly squeezed. It must yeah. be. Three quarter shot of sugar syrup, rich, and two shots of black tea. Cold. Black tea. Interesting. Black okay, I'm tea. pretty sure. I, I don't think this is what my brother made for me, but I'm nearly certain he called it a Tom Arnold. Now, the Arnold Palmer I'm looking at. Not alcoholic, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, apparently it's the exact same drink just without the alcohol <laughs> it's black tea lemon juice and sugar syrup okay uh you know we're not gonna get to the bottom of this one tonight shout out to my brother for making me whatever that cocktail was it was delicious shout out shout out oh i just saw that tom arnold uh, is is recently celebrated five years sober it must be it must you... be difficult to get sober <laughs> having an alcoholic <laughs> drink named after you <laughs> man i want this drink named after me my, my dr pepper although dr pepper is or sorry uh captain pepper funny enough dr morgan that's a pseudonym i went by online back in the days when i was writing reviews for an online magazine of heavy metal albums oh wow i didn't know you did that i briefly wrote for a magazine as well so this is really embarrassing, and I wouldn't tell this if I wasn't under the affluence of being called anyway, but I once tried to be, uh, what's the word, YouTuber. I had a YouTube channel where I did reviews of heavy metal albums. Yeah, I think, again, I think you mentioned this before. If it wasn't on air, it was off air, because I, I had only just found this out recently. Right, so it was the cringiest shit I've ever done, but I, refu- <laughs> I refused to take them down, mainly because I've forgotten the password to that, to that <laughs> fucking account, right? But some guy, some Irish guy, I don't know where he was based, Ireland anyway, but he he sent me an email and he was like, hey, I really like your reviews. I've got an online magazine. Would you like to contribute review articles for new albums and shit? Because I can get early access to new albums and stuff. Was it called Cringe Monthly? Sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just, I'm just saying that based on what you said about your, your reviews. No, mine were cringy as fuck because it was me in front of a camera with like these Agent Smith sunglasses from The Matrix. And at the camera, you know, it was like, welcome back to Doc Morgan's Reviews. I don't know why I was American all of a sudden. Welcome back to Doc Morgan's Reviews. Today, we're going to talk about this new band, man. And it was fun. Like, it was fun to put together the videos and shit like that. But then I started contributing these articles to this magazine, like free of charge, of course, naturally, like you volunteer. It's all about supporting the community. It's all mm-hmm. about supporting the community, the, the heavy metal community here in Ireland. But then here's the fucking kicker, right? Once upon a time, one day I went to log on to this website just to see what other reviews there were to check out some new tunes and music and shit like that. And it turns out the website was gone. Yeah. Right? Oh, my God. This is I, I again, I wrote a couple of articles for a website. That website no longer exists. I can't if I wanted to start a write, writing portfolio, I wouldn't be able to get to my articles. Right. Now, I have found my articles again as document attachments in an email to the guy who ran this website, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not on the website, so it doesn't fucking count. But instead of the website, there was just like this notice written by the guy saying, oh, I've been doing this for 20 something odd years. I've decided to give it up now. Leave the website up, man. Yeah. How much is website hosting? It's not that fucking much. I mean, if he's got his goodbye message there, then he's still paying hosting, right? <laughs> you can't just you can't just sit on a fucking URL. Exactly. <laughs> fucking exactly. <laughs> oh man, I was so pissed about that. Yeah, I'm pretty disappointed. I, I wrote for a, a local Toronto publication online only called Step On Magazine, and I wrote like. Uh, I don't even know what you call it. Like a review seems like too strong a word, but I basically wrote a report about a music festival I went to, you know, like uh, sort of what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it. I guess it was kind of a review, but it was more like, you know, it a report feels like a, a more uh, uh, accurate word for it. And then I wrote a retrospective article uh, about the first season of the Simpsons. And now that website has been completely nuked as well. They've got no oh. apology message. They just, they just let the fucking domain expire. Man, what a heap of bullshit. So uh, both of us, you know, writers with published writers with n- absolutely no proof. <laughs> yeah, but hey, listen, this this right here, this right here, this shit, right? Uh-huh. This is always going to be on the Internet in some form or another. And on that note, it's time to go. Whoa. Back to the island. Slick. <laughs> That was the worst segue we've ever done. And this week we are covering the episode Ellipses 
and found, which is season two, episode five of the. I was going to say of the second season of Lost. I just the said season fucking two. note of panic. As soon as you said the word ellipses, I was like, no, 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 wait, I don't remember that word. <laughs> in the title. Did I watch the wrong episode? What? <laughs> nah, it's and found dot 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 and found, uh, which first aired the 19th of October, 2005. This is the 30th episode of Lost. Hey, that's a nice round number. It's not one of the numbers, but it's a nice round number. Yeah. Something of a of a milestone, I guess. The title and found is obviously like a sort of uh, reference callback to the first gin centric episode, which was called Ellipses in Translation. And obviously it's an episode of Lost, so it's lost and found, lost in translation. It also, I guess, refers to Sun losing and then finding her ring. Like a lot of these episode titles, I think that is the surface level interpretation of it, that mm-hmm. the writers just feed to you if you scratch just a little bit below the surface there is a deeper meaning there between you know the uh what's happening in the a plot and the title there's something mm. else to be got there i think yeah what do you think that that is or should we what say am i meant to know <laughs> also i wanted to ask you this what would you consider the a plot and what would you consider the b plot in this because son and jin share the flashbacks right so is Sun losing a ring, the A plot, or is Jin traipsing through the jungle with the tailies, the A plot? Run through the jungle. That is that's our A plot right there. Also, why have we never brought up that song before? You have. You did that exact thing when we talked about running through the jungle. <laughs> Gotta run through the jungle. Oh man, I love that song. I love that band. It is funny that it took until season two for us to start like regularly repeating ourselves. <laughs> like no, we had, no, 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 we had no. a season of content in us. Davey <laughs> boy, back in your box. It did not take two seasons for us to start repeating our jokes. <laughs> it took like episode four, I think, season one before I started repeating my <laughs> jokes. Okay, uh, you're very kind. You're very kind. This episode was directed by our boy Stephen Williams, who we've seen fairly recently. Uh, episode two of this season, he directed. Has he directed another one since? I don't think so. I have a confession to make. Go on. I do not know or recognize any of these director names. Even if they've been brought up like 20 times, I'm like, okay, whoa. Awesome. (laughs) Stephen Williams, we did have a debate about that. I cut most of them. I'm currently editing season two, uh, episode two, uh, which is, I think, the last one Stephen Williams directed. He's the uh, Canadian Jamaican guy, I think. Uh, He directed all the best cowboys at daddy issues in season one. Ah, oh, that's a really good episode. I like that yeah. episode. And he becomes a lot more of a regular uh, from season two, I think, until the end. This episode was written by the top dogs, Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof. Uh, I guess I'll have more to say about that at the end when I give my review, but kind of expect better from Probably because of, like <laughs> such big, heavy hitter writers and it was such a shit episode. Yeah. Okay. Well, we you know, we could save it. I, I don't think it's it's irredeemably bad. Like there's there's some good stuff in here but uh you know we could talk about it man you know me i traditionally don't wait till the end i blow my load as early as possible they are like this is a well it's not a crap episode i mean there's no such thing as a crap episode of lost right Mm. no such thing you'll agree with me on this (laughs) you'll agree (laughs) let's get to season three and see how we feel about (laughs) that All right, yeah, all right, all right. nah, it's it's definitely a filler. And I think last episode I said there, you know, that the Hurley episode we had was a little bit of a filler, but that it was an entertaining one. This one I don't feel as positively about. Well, here's the thing. I've never found the Jin and Sun episodes to be as entertaining nah. as all the rest of them. Even my boy Jorge Garcia, even his inclusion in this episode, I felt that was a little bit I mean, Hurley's a funny comedic guy already as a character, but even this felt like a bit of a parody of Hurley. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah, I feel you. Right. We'll get to it. Listen to the end of the episode to hear more (laughs) of our thoughts. Also, these are the types of episodes. This happened when we. What the fuck is that? (laughs) Listen to the episode now to hear our thoughts. Well, yeah, yeah, but you know what I mean? Stay tuned is what I'm saying. I guess that's what they say in the biz. Don't touch that dial. I also have a way for thin trivia section for this, just to spoil that ahead. Uh, th- these are the sort of mid-season episodes you get into where they're just not as flashy as the other ones, and there's just not as much info about them online. You know how it'd be. Anyway, let's get into it. I never really talked about the previously on Lost, but do you have anything to say about it? Nah, not particularly. It just catches us up on on the crack, you know? The we've usual. seen it all <laughs> the, before. The entire point. Yeah, we've seen it enough fucking times as well. 
Okay, so we open with some nice, soft, melancholy music from our boy Chiquino. And we open with this beautifully framed shot of Son and Claire on the beach. And I got to say, the opening and closing shots of this episode are probably the best things about it. <laughs> like, the, the two of them are really nice. Yeah, but this scene here, right? Claire and Son. Why is Claire so fucking allergic to having her baby around? <laughs> she yeah. hates that little thing. Like, she's ditched it on Charlie, on Locke, or whoever. Charlie better be getting overtime because he is looking after that thing 24 seven. He's mercifully absent from this episode. Actually, I guess I just noticed that, but they seem to be wringing out some rags, maybe like doing a bit of laundry, which means that Rose has kept mom on the new laundromat that just opened in the it's hatch. Also it's also a sneaky little bit of foreshadowing, right? Cause they're ringing. <laughs> oh. No, 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 no. Bit of Go foreshadowing. On. They're cleaning out the rags, and later on, spoilers, I apologize, we see Locke with a rag, and he says, it's clean, uh, right? Oh, damn. Uh, that's like that's like one of my closing trivia points. These are the <laughs> theories you come here for, kids. Where else are you going to get? Try Just try listening to Lost in My 40s for that kind of analysis. <laughs> no, just kidding, obviously. Shout out to them. Rival podcast. Uh, Son is staring pensively out at the sea and she comments that it's been four days referring to when the raft left and that puts us at day 47 on the island which you mentioned last ep I think we should start doing so I implemented it there I would very much like to keep track of the days that's passing on the island. so we're on day 47 and you know what the funny thing is it does not feel like 47 days 47 days is like what a week and a, a month and a, a half a month and a half yeah do you think it feels shorter or longer Oh, it feels like they've been there for 10 fucking years already. <laughs> I'm sure it feels like that to them as well. Oh. Yeah, so we're day 47. Uh, son's a little worried about the raft. Claire assures her that, you know, it can take up to two weeks to find a current. Son looks down at her father's watch, I believe, right? Jin left it with her before he left. Yes, indeed he did. Mr. Pike's watch. Yeah. And then she starts freaking out in Korean because she lost her bleeding wedding ring. Yeah, did we get subtitles for that? No, and uh, you know what? I probably could have for my trivia because it was way for thin, uh, but I, I didn't ha- I didn't look up what the Korean was. Did you happen to get on that? Yeah, yeah, I have it here. She says, oh my God, what to do? What should I do? Where have you been? Where did you go? Where are you? Please. <laughs> it's like the weirdest song lyrics ever. <laughs> Where have you been? I'm guessing that like s- sounds, you know, more normal in Korean than... It does translate into English. Like, <laughs> if I lost something, I wouldn't go, where have you been? Well, do you know what the funny thing is? Google Translate has a really helpful uh, kind of like English phoneticization thing going on here. Mm-hmm. So she says something like, Io mio, io ti o gay, io ti o gay, io de gas g, io de gas g, io de seo, jebal. I'll tell you, after uh, after Hurley's Korean pronunciation last week, I think Jorge Garcia will need to give you a few lessons when he comes on here to drink tins with us. Ah, come <laughs> on, Mr. Garcia. Senor Garcia, you know. Please do. It, you are welcome on this episode. In fact, we almost fucking insist at this point. Please, thank you. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, it would really help us out. I think he's got a movie out today, Jorge Garcia. I think The Monsters comes out today, directed by Rob Zombie. Reviews so far have been... Not very good. It's a Rob Zombie movie. What the fuck do you expect? <laughs> the review... Okay, so hang on. I-, I know we're talking about the episode. We don't want to get derailed too much. We're on a schedule here. Rob Zombie movies are for Rob Zombie fans. No one else, okay? <laughs> you know, he's one-, <laughs> he's one of these niche uh, directors that has his own um, community of people that are so all about his movies because his movies are so- like... You watch any three seconds of a Rob Zombie movie, you can tell it's a Rob fucking zombie movie, right? These are not for a general audience. They're for Rob Zombie fans. And not his music fans either. They're sort of like quirky, quirky little comedies, right? Like, uh, I don't know how you describe them. I don't think I've ever seen a Rob Zombie movie, but I, I know the sort of vibe you're talking about. Yeah. Um, Sh- schlocky, uh, schlocky B-movie. Boom. Like... Hammer horror parody almost. You Absolutely, know. Yeah. yeah. Man, you nailed it. Schlocky's great. Hammer horror for sure. Like throwbacks, but like you know, I, I think I think there is like a, a love there for those movies, a passion, but I don't think he translate them very well or whatever. 
all that is to say, Jorge, we just shit on your movie that we haven't even seen, but come on the podcast. <laughs> you can plug it. It sounds like it needs it. <laughs> um, so Sun has lost her ring. Uh, she's freaking out. This triggers a flashback where she's digging in a jewelry box and she inspects what I thought was a hat pin, but then she puts it in her hair. So it's a hair pin, I guess. It's, it's a pin. You can put it wherever the fuck you want. Okay, they're interchangeable. Okay, that's good to know because I was convinced that's what a hat pin looked like. Uh, she's sitting in this very lavish bedroom. She's wearing a lovely dress, a dress on which an older woman negatively comments on as she enters the frame. You know, she says, "Ugh, you're going to go out in that. Uh, the woman takes on shoes that she had planned to wear. That's a classic mom comment. Yeah, like I mean, you, yeah. you get dressed, you're about to go out and your mother just asks, you're not wearing that, are you? Like, fuck off. Wear whatever I want. She obviously doesn't have to call her mom for us to know. So I, I guess I'll refer to this woman as Mrs. Pike. She takes the shoes son we're planning on wearing. And she, you know, those shoes are really going to tie her outfit together. And she hands her a pair of flats stating he might be shorter than you. So we learned the obvious. Like I said, this is son's ma. And, and she looks, it's very interesting. Son's ma, obviously this is my Western bias here. But she looks, she has this look about her that's usually only reserved for middle-aged white ladies, upper class. Do you know what I mean? She somehow manages to, I mean, I guess it's just a stuck-up upper class look. But Yeah, and maybe that's just universal. Or maybe they've become like slightly more westernized through the media or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. She just has a very uh, dislikable face, I thought. And as I always say, when there's a rich character I don't like, they'll be it with the rest of them. She reveals that Son is going on a matchmaker date and she chastises her for not getting a husband in college. Son responds, feminist AF, that she went to college to get a degree. Mama Pike responds, anti-feminist AF, that she's already considered silver teetering on bronze. Now, that is terminology I've never heard before, but you don't really need to have heard it before to no, get where she's going, no. right? I did look it up a little bit. I couldn't actually find a lot about bronze or even silver, but I did... I did find there's like a golden woman thing in Korea. Less common now, I think, thankfully. But it was basically um, an upper class woman with good education uh, and, you know, good uh, good wealth who is single. So a golden woman is considered like, you know, a, the, the best kind of woman to marry in this really problematic and sexist old fashioned attitude. Yeah, this family is real Gangnam style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Sun says she'll tie herself down when she's good and ready. But apparently son's dickweed father thinks that she's ready now. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. Mr. Pike could suck a dick. Oh, he can get he can eat my whole ass. I could not give him a <laughs> fuck. That man is so bad. He's he's scum. We cut within this flashback still to this uh, relatively shitty looking apartment. I mean, it's a fine apartment, but compared to the room we were just in, it's a bit of a hole. Uh, and Jin is getting ready for what we later learn is a job interview while his roommate is yammering on about how this will be the year that love finds him. I love this. Like I imagine having, you know, get yourself the kind of roommate who just sits there and fucking bigs you up about get your you destiny. A hype man. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's just like, he's This dude's clearly unemployed. And he's just, his whole purpose is to sit in Jen's apartment and go, this is your year, man. You're getting, yeah. But get... usually the trope is, you know, the, the, the unemployed housemate is sitting there looking schlubby, you know, playing video games. They've got the headset on, just kind of giving a, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not paying attention at all. Whereas he's invested in Jin's future. Yeah. He's, he's reading the Destiny book, man. 100%. Yeah. What Jin calls the be- Destiny book, which is what his roommate is consulting. Uh, this is where he gets his prediction that Jin finds the, will find love or love will find him, rather. Jin asks, you know, what kind of woman, you know, so I know what to look for. And his roomie says, Orange, cursing him to a life with a ginger. Yeah, so Jin and his roommate, they argue back and forth about re- whether Jin is ready for a woman, who looks after who in a relationship. And Jin, he firmly establishes his very traditional values here. He says a man should have a goal and he's supposed to work hard to attain it so that he can provide. And he also reveals this sort of self-deprecating, like classist attitude that he has. He brands himself the mere son of a fisherman. Yeah, but this is all set before that flashback in season one that we had with Jin, where he comes to terms with, uh, where he's from yeah and accepting his past and his dad like we've seen him go through that already yeah and they try to bring this class thing around at the end of this episode again but i don't know the whole thing falls a little bit flat for me we can uh we can we can talk about it more when we get there yeah 
Uh, so he gets up to leave for his job interview and his roommate can't deny. Our boy Jin's looking fly. Jin's got swag, but he knows swag ain't cheap. So he has left the tag on his tie so they can return it after because that thing was fucking spenny. Smart man. Um, the roommate asks, you know, what should I do if love calls? Please hold, says Jin. <laughs> Tell it to wait. We cut back to Jin uh, looking like I do after a job interview. Uh, namely sweaty, distressed, and sitting in a dark, dank room questioning my life choices. Yeah, I, we've all been there. Yeah, so Jin is in what we are now calling the tail hole. The tail hole. I love it. Hole. And I don't think we'll get to call it that for many more episodes, so we might as well enjoy it while we can. Uh, Michael and Sawyer are chilling there as well. Sawyer's having a little snooze, it seems like. And the tailies are huddled across the room. They're discussing, you know, what's to be done, presumably. We have established that they've all been on the same fucking plane why is there this level of distrust between them i don't Hmm. get it i mean i don't know necessarily i think they're just talking shop they're talking what they're supposed to do what they should do with the lads you know the lads are no longer i mean i guess they're somewhat there under duress still do you know what i mean but you know we quickly learned that they want to pool resources basically so i think i think at this point it still makes sense for the tailies to be sc- discussing things as a group not to let the three boys into the fold just yet it could especially considering all the trauma that we get hip to that they've what been through fold? what fold what so here here's my point right the tailies are not a community there's only like five of them yeah right? there's six actually if i could just speak on that really quick it is funny that like they had 23 at the start and now i thought maybe there would be some like extras in the background but no it is just i think six named characters left right we have Anna lucia mr echo bernard cindy libby yeah you're right it's five right right that's that's crazy like they've lost 18 people they are not in a position to be giving orders as soon as they find <laughs> out that michael son and uh, michael Jin and sawyer i don't know why i keep calling sawyer son S sound, (laughs) sibilance, whatever. But as soon as they find out that they've come from, you know, the front section survivors, the survivors, the main survivors, they should be on their fucking hands and knees. Please take us to your people. You seem to be thriving. You actually have survivors. Not many of your people have died. Please, please, please. We are struggling. Look where we're living in this fucking tail hole where there's only (laughs) five of us left. Please take us with you. But Anna Lucia still has to keep up this macho bullshit, you know, shift her balls in her pants because she's got to be all like, okay, we're going back to your people. Like she's giving orders instead of fucking begging them. Where does she get off on this? Well, in their defense, and I, I mostly agree with you, to be honest, I think that's the sensible thing. They do establish pretty good in this episode, though, that these guys are fucking terrified of the others yeah. do you know what i mean they won't go near their territory mr echo is scared of them he's a fucking tank he's a beast he's a beast and that's really clever as well echo is a fucking monster of a man and he's scared of them exactly so that's yeah. really good communication to the audience that mm-hmm. we should be fucking scared of these people so i think it, it explains if if it doesn't justify uh some of their behavior at least some of their skittishness you know yeah anyway like i said Jin's look pretty uh, distressed. Mikey picks up on his emotional turmoil and he very empathetically assures him that he's going to see his wife again. You know, you'll see her again, man. Mike then wakes Sawyer from his nap and he points to the Taylor's convo. Uh, Sawyer, you know, characteristically predicts that they're about to be Taylor dinner. That is what I said last episode. I predicted yeah. that the Taylor's were eating people. Cannibal vibes, right? Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I guess like the lads don't fully know what happened to the other 18 people as well. So it's probably still in the back of their heads. Mm-hmm. He approaches the lads and, he, and she tells them to get up. They're heading out to get food and water and it's all hands on deck. They have to help. Uh, Sawyer kicks up a fuss because of course he does. It's Sawyer. But Anna Lucia says they got a long walk ahead of them. They're going back to the Losty camp. We're going home, boys. Hey, it's about fucking time. So maybe we like this is just a long roundabout way of introducing some new characters to our main cast. Yeah. Pumping a bit of life into the show. And you know what? Like TV shows do this when they come into a new season. They'll introduce new characters to just give a fucking adrenaline shot of life to the show to give something new. And this is a really great fucking organic way of doing it. Yeah, this 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 is a I agree with you. It's a very organic example. We get our title card. Lost. And we're into Act 2. Act 2, here we go. The whole gang emerges from the tail hole and Anna Lucia gives them the all clear. And again, this here is implying that these tailies are sort of always looking over their shoulder. You know, they're very on edge. They're cautious as fuck. And this is Mm -hmm. clearly from experience. 
yeah, they seem like traumatized, terrified. Sawyer does a little promotion here for a competitor TV series, Prison Break. Hey, do you watch Prison Break? <laughs> No, I think I get I, I, I fucking phrase of the week here, but I think we did talk about this before. My mom, my brother watched it when it was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, so I does a little promotion for Prison Break by suggesting him and Mike binge it. Mike says he heard it's pretty mid, so he'd rather watch Lost to see what the crack with the tailies are. Basically, good choice. Right? Good choice. Yeah. No, he he essentially says that, right? So he's like, "Why don't we do a little prison break?" And Mikey's kind of like, "I want to see what happens here." Like, <laughs> he's like, "We don't really know the vibe yet. Let's let's check it out." And Lucia outlines the plan. They need to get as much food as possible, travel in pairs, quickly and quietly. That pairs idea pretty quickly falls apart, though. Mike has picked up on the tension and he asks the, he straight up asks them, like, why do you all seem so terrified? And Lucia gives a sarcastic response. So many similarities between her and Sawyer. They're so alike, which is why they clash. Uh, And then Mr. Echo announces that he's going to go scout. And Lucia tells Cindy to join him. She also tells Libby to go and gather fruit and to bring Michael. Uh, Libby very, you know, endearingly says, you know, like he's got a name because Anna Lucia says bring him. Uh, so I think they're setting her up as this, you know, uh, likable character. And she's assertive when she does it. She's, you know, she she can stand up to Anna Lucia, which is yeah. nice. I mean, it's it, it's Michelle Rodriguez just playing Michelle Rodriguez. The same as like, she's always the exact same character in everything she's in. She's so yeah. typecast. She's always like this bossy, take no nonsense, uh, tomboyish, non girly. Doesn't doesn't fit in with the women. Gun toting badass. Mm-hmm. Everything she's in. No respect for authority, kind of. I think the closest they got to feminizing her was in like the first Fast and Furious movie. I think every time I see her, I don't even think of Lost. I think of Resident Evil. Did you ever see Resident Evil? No, nah, no, nah, but I, 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 I know that's yeah. You're a big stan for that. Anna Lucia tells Libby and Michael to go collect food, and then she mentions fishing, which Jin enthusiastically volunteers for. And he's got Sawyer's props as fish. well, you know. Fish. fish. <laughs> he, like he knows him some shit about fish. I know he's he's getting back to his element. Like he's fucking well up for this. Anna Lucia agrees, and Jin goes with her and Bernard, leaving Sawyer unemployed for the time being. I guess. Oh, well, I mean, man's got like a fucking gammy shoulder. I mean, he's not. He's he's good to neither God nor man at this. Time. I feel like Anna Lucia would still go hard on him, but nonetheless, we cut away from that scene without knowing what task he was assigned. Sit there and look pretty, I guess. Uh, we cut back to Sun, and she's frantically searching for her ring. Jack takes notice, and he sticks his nose in as per usual. Sun tells him what's up. You know, I lost a ring, and then he proceeds to just waste her fucking time by telling her an anecdote about when he lost his wedding ring once, and they ended up having a replica made before he. Offers his assistance looking for it. Sun politely declines his offer. Uh, and then we're back to Jin doing what he does best. Speaking, which is... speaking of Jack, have you seen that new Matthew Fox show, Last Light? I haven't seen it, no, but I did. I think I saw it advertised somewhere. Good to see. Uh, I mean, I was going to say good to see Foxy back in our lives. I, 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 I don't have any particular like love for him or anything. But Well, you know. uh, listen, I don't want to go on another TV tangent, right? But let me just give you two numbers from Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> which which do you want first, the audience or hit me with the audience? Which uh, I very pretentiously put less stock in than the critic. Thirty two. Oof. Critics twenty. Oh, <laughs> the, the old lost alumni are not doing well with the old telly lately. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, now I do hear that uh, Harold Perrineau show is really good though. It's got a. Uh... A couple of the lost producers associated with it, they're working on it. It's a really awkward, like, one word title that's a very, like, kind of, you know, shit name for a TV show, but it's supposed to be really good. Yeah, because it's super fucking difficult to Google. It's called From. From, yeah. Shit name, but supposedly really, really good. Maybe we will do a bonus app on it at some point. Harold Perrino is genuinely one of the best actors to come, to come from Lost. I mean, I know Lost isn't where he started or anything like that, but of all yeah. the Lost actors that there have been, He's genuinely one of the best. One hundred percent. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if I'd call him the best, but he's fucking up there. He can turn it on as well. He can. He can do an emotional scene like it's nobody's business. Not a doubt. He's fantastic. I don't know that he was really given uh given a chance to stretch his talents as much as he could have been with the role of Michael. To be honest. Yeah, he wasn't given that much to work with. To be honest. Sometimes, you know, like I said, there's there's some quite emotional scenes. That the the sort of father son relationship stuff really works. Yeah, uh, the father son relationship in season one of him being like this new dad, and he doesn't know mm-hmm. how to be a dad to a teenage son, and all of a sudden they're fucking plane wrecked on an island, 
together and he has to deal with that as well. That yeah. is so interesting. And then they just turn him into a one word character and he's like, whoa! <laughs> I mean, sure, I get it. That like, even though he's a new dad, he's never known his son. He's never had a son in his life before. And here he is like hardcore dedicating mm-hmm. every fiber of his being to getting this boy back. That's good shit. That's cool. Do something with it now. Speaking of doing things well, we're back to Jin doing what he does best, which is depinning a sea urchin. He's doing his fishing thing. Yeah, he's just tossing the, the spines into the water as if it's like breadcrumbs to the ducks. Yeah, spines. There you go. Nice word. Ana Lucia and Bernard are fucking around with a net in, sh- in shallow tide, close enough to him without much luck. So Ana Lucia asks for Jin to show him how it's done. He, like his wife with Jack, also politely declines to do so. Yeah. <laughs> he's just like, nah, I'm not going to do that. Him and Anna Lucia exchange some shit talk in their own respective languages. Uh, did you get a translation there? So what Jin says to them is, it's like fishing, and then you starve to death. <laughs> is that like a weird teach a man to fish? Like, did he mess that phrase up? <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter what he said, really, because Jin decides to let his skills do the talking. He fucks the net into the water, just very casually, and immediately catches a fucking Sunday dinner's worth of fish. <laughs> like, he's got like three, you know, brightly colored, at least three fish in there. And even though this man only knows, I'd say, like 10 words in English, He's able to drop the fucking mic here. Yeah. Just bundles up the net, armful of fish in front of these plebs, these <laughs> noobs, and just looks at them dead in the eye and goes, fish. I would be surprised if that was Korean for owned. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, like, like Ali Lucia and, uh, and Bernard are finding it difficult to hide how impressed they are. They're both kind of like, yeah, he's, he's got us. Dude knows his craft. Like, it, it's exactly what, what Sawyer said earlier on. He said, man knows how to fish. How are you? I'll bring him with you. <laughs> yeah. This triggers a flashback, this uh, dr- mic drop from Jin. And we go to him, from him nailing a job to just pure enduring a job interview. The chappie behind the desk is studying his CV, asks him questions about experience. And he pr- picks up pretty quickly that Jin is a country boy, right? He asks him what village he hails from. Jin's from Namhae, he says, uh, which I looked up. It's actually a, a big ass island. There's a lot of villages called Namhae with a with a suffix or a prefix. Right. Uh, so you know, it is the south coast. Here's the thing. It's no secret. I've mentioned it many, many of the time. I work in a hotel. I'm a hotel manager, right? Mm-hmm. As in, I'm a manager in a hotel, not a hotel manager. That's a distinct job title where you're like <laughs> quite high up in the food chain. No, no, no. I I'm... mean, that's just, this is the interviewer guy. He's pretty much that, right? Well, uh, yeah, he's quite high up. But I mean, I'm a department manager. I've done interviews before. I've gone to countless interviews for other jobs, right? It's practically a hobby of mine. I go to interviews without any intention of taking the job just to feel wanted, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's kind of like going on dates for validation. I go to job interviews, not with any real intention of taking them, but I've also conducted job interviews for prospective hires as well. And Jin does the worst fucking interview I have ever seen. So the first question we hear the interviewer ask is, you worked at the Asiana Hotel. And Jin just says, yes. As a busboy, I became a waiter, sir. I was like, no, man, you got to expand on this. You got to sell yourself. You got to give me a little story here. Give Give me more than this, right? The only thing I would say, again, in the show's defense is that maybe there's a different culture to this kind of thing in Korea. I mean, Jin is like avoiding eye contact with this guy, not in a way that he seems nervous, although he does seem nervous, but rather like it's like he's showing doing it as a sign of respect. Do you know what I mean? Uh, It feels like a real cultural respectful thing to be doing. Yeah. So this dude in the suit, he gives him some discriminatory bullshit. Uh, and smelling like fish you know oh you're from yeah i thought you might have been i could smell the fish what a fucking scumbag yeah he's he's a real like uh fuck this dude again i'd have him reported to a fucking ombudsman real quick then he uh like nails on a chalkboard here for anyone who's broke he spots the tag on the tie and he rips it off and he goes oh this was sticking out <laughs> and Jin dies a little inside fun fact that man could be done for assault for that really oh yeah in Korea? I don't know about in Korea, but definitely here. Yeah. So Jin's been completely robbed of his dignity, basically. But Cuntface, he picks up the phone and he tells the person on the other end that Mr. Kwan got the job. And Jin looks over the moon. His new employer begins uh, listing his new horrific working conditions. Always on call. No raises. No time off. Don't even ask for this shit. Yeah. So I've gone and done a Google Translate of the Korean that's said here. And it's very similar, but it's not exactly the same. So he picks up the phone. This manager picks up the phone to like his secretary or whatever and says, 
from today, appoint Jin Su Kwon as an employee. And then he says to Jin, start working right now and work hard, whether it rains or snows. But there is no salary increase or vacation. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'd have him in front of like, like I'd go to a union about that shit. <laughs> yeah. Although to be fair, it's less obnoxious in the actual translation because in the subtitles of the episode, he doesn't say there is none. He says, "Don't ask for a raise. Don't ask for time off. You know, just pure fucking abuse. Yeah. Absolute nightmare employment scenario." Uh, an office golfer sort of bursts in immediately, and he he marches in with a uniform and fucking dick breath behind the desk confirms Jin's new place of employment. He's working in the Seoul. Gateway Hotel. Jin is on that fucking Edo career path, man. He's getting into the hotel viz. That is a job I had to do, standing at the door and just welcoming people once upon a time. Bookface boss, he hammers the last nail into the classist coffin. He tells Jin, don't open the door for people like you. And I'll tell you, this flashback will be enough to fucking radicalize you. Oh, uh, 100%. But Jin, no, like he has the wherewithal to let himself process those words for a minute. And, and then he just says, yes, I understand. I know what you're saying. You know what you're saying. I know that you know that I know what you're saying. Okay, fine. Let's just do this. Again, sort of tying it back to what Jin's sort of low opinion of himself before. Is this going to pay off? Uh, Let's wait and see. We cut to Michael and Libby and they're on their forage. Libby apologizes for the whole, you know, throwing Michael and his friends in a pit thing. And we're learning that she's the nice one of the group. I guess Bernard seemed pretty nice. Yeah, her and Bernard are like, they've dropped the pretense. They're being human. They're being yeah. personable. They're being friendly. Anna Lucia is still keeping up this bullshit. This, you know, I'm the boss woman. I'm in charge. Even Echo a little bit. Like, yeah, he, he cracks in this episode, but he he is still playing the tough man at this point. Yeah, he's still got his guard up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Michael throws some shade here by saying he never really thought of the two lads as friends. <laughs> <laughs> which gets fucked <laughs> after that time on the rap. Like, yeah, that was that was hurtful to me when he said that. <laughs> I was like, come on, dude. Especially not Sawyer. He notes like, you know, which is pretty cold. And maybe this is a stretch, but maybe foreshadows some of Michael's later misdeeds towards the end of the season. You know, the yeah. fact that he doesn't consider these people friends is interesting considering his later behavior. Ooh, I wonder what you could be talking about. <laughs> and the fact that he's saying that to Libby as well is terrifying. Libby reckons Sawyer was scared, which is a very interesting take on his on his whole attitude so far. And she says she knows scared from personal experience. Michael asks, you know, you're scared. Is that why you threw us in the pit? And Libby says, well, yeah, it's that. And that they, the Tailies, have trust issues. And I wasn't 100% sure what she meant by that watching this. Because, again, long time since I've seen this. But there's another scene later in this episode that fully brings it back <laughs> yeah, to me. And yeah. I was like, oh wow. I know the this... one you're talking about. Yeah, I'm I I you know, there's a there's an episode all about the tailies coming up. I'm very excited for that one. So Michael brushes it off, you know, he's like, whatever. And then he asks, why is there no fruit? Libby says they pick these trees clean and Michael suggests they head inland because that's how they do in the Losty Camp. They go right in to get their fruit. But Libby cryptically says that they don't go that way. Because that's where they come from. They, the ominous they. Capital T, they. Yeah, again, hammering at home. These tailies are dealing with some fucking trauma. Some some shit's been going down with them. Yeah, they've gone through some shit. And I can't wait to find out what it is in two episodes time. We cut back to Sawyer, who's clearly feeling pretty sleepy this episode. And I guess the tail hole didn't look all that cozy and comfortable, to be fair. But I think there probably is a reason for that. <laughs> namely his bullet wound <laughs> um, <laughs> and the infection that's going to be running rampant through his system right yeah now. it didn't really occur to me though until the later scene where he sort of you know they're walking along and he loses the strength to walk for a little bit so up until that point i was like sorry it's very sleepy this episode <laughs> like, <laughs> i just thought they're like yeah fuck it let's make him tired come on man the fuck up <laughs> And Lucia, Bernard, Cindy, and Jin are all huddled in the background. Jin's in the in- inner fold now. Uh, they're sorting through their hall of food. Of course he's in the inner fold. He doesn't understand a fucking word that's happening. True. Yeah, it's not like he's going to fucking bring intel anywhere. Right. Uh, Sawyer's awoken by a knife thunking into the log beside his head, which Mr. Echo kindly but intimidatingly giving it to him for his protection on the journey ahead. Now, that's a friendly move right there. Yeah. <laughs> Now, this knife is an artisanal Mr. Echo original, right? This cunt, Saeed-level 
fucking craftsmanship here. <laughs> yeah. He probably, I guess, and he fashioned it from like a piece of plane debris. Yeah, it looks like it. I mean, that plane was made of a lot of metal. So if we're going to get metal, it's going to be from the plane. Yeah, right? but it's impressive. Like, it's fully a fucking hatchet made, like, that he's just crafted. It's a machete. He's got high craft skill. We also learn Mr. Echo's name here, which is Mr. Echo. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then Sawyer questions it. He's like, so what's that? Like, Mr. Ed? <laughs> Mr. Echo gives a funny look. He goes... Yes, <laughs> which reminds me of uh, Saeed's yes in the last season. Do you remember where, uh, who was it? It was like Sawyer or somebody was like, are you enjoying this? Because Saeed was trolling him and Saeed goes, yes. <laughs> Mr. Echo does a very similar yes here. But that's a nice, uh, it's another one of Sawyer's classic callbacks, Mr. Ed. Yeah, okay. So, so I, I mean, I don't want to jump ahead to this because it's in my trivia and there's not a lot of it. But has he referenced Mr. Ed before? Oh, you are asking the wrong guy here. You know I've got memory issues. I have not fucking okay. clue. Yeah, because I, I had I had heard I do you know I have a feeling it wasn't in the show before I just heard them I heard someone talking about it on another podcast recently. But like Mr. Ed is a is a reference that I got based on recently learning about it. You know what I mean? Right. I, I'll, I'll talk more about it in the in the trivia. But their conversation's interrupted by Libby, who runs up to Anna Lucia to report that Michael fucked off into the jungle. Now, is it just me, or did I suspect shenanigans on Libby's part here at first? Why do you say that? Because we never saw Mike running into the jungle. We just see the two of them together, and then next thing we see, Libby comes back without him with some explanation for his absence, right? I think it would have made more sense to show Michael doing that. But I suppose we are given enough to rationalize why Michael would do that. Do you know what? I just just occurred to me, I didn't notice this in the episode, but when it shows them huddling around the food, there's like a bunch of fruit and stuff that's been picked. If Libby and Michael weren't there, then who the fuck got that fruit? Was it Sawyer? Libby and Michael are useless as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> they, got, they contributed nothing, basically, and then Michael fucked off. Maybe Libby couldn't carry all of her limes, like whatever fruit she had. <laughs> so as she's coming back to them, she just started tossing them ahead. So when we see her actually come through the bushes, she's not holding the fruit and it's all there. She, her, and, her and Michael were like over the clearing going like, <laughs> Kobe, Jordan. And then while Libby was distracted, Kobe. Michael, <laughs> Michael fucking pegged it away. Yeah, okay. I like that. I like that uh, right. head cannon. So this this uh, this report immediately prompts Anna Lucia to decide that they're leaving. They're moving out. Jin begins speaking in rapid Korean to Sawyer before landing on the only word that he needs to explain what he thinks is up. He says, Walt. He says, Michael lost his son and he's on his way to find him. So over there, you think you're alive somewhere. I feel like that's Google just being a bit weird now, <laughs> yeah, to be honest. Probably. Thank you for that Korean translation. So Anna Lucia immediately starts dishing out commands and she tells Libby to cover the radio. And Sawyer can't believe they have one. And he asks if it works and she replies with her usual sarcasm. You know, he said, did you try calling someone? Oh, why didn't I think of that? She says... Why does Libby need to cover it then? I guess if they get an incoming signal? Um, I don't know. I feel like this is something that does get revealed that we find out later that I've forgotten about. Well, we do know uh, that they did speak to one of the Losties at one point. That is true. We did reveal that. Do you know, I guess maybe based on that, um, that's why they, they, they cover the radio in case something else comes through. They found a random radio, started carrying it around, and then one day a fucking transmission burst through. So mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, we're going to hold on to this. Just yeah. in case. <laughs> Jin wants to go after Michael, but Ana Lucia says they're leaving, quote, before he can tell them where we are. So again, you know, all this alluding to the mysterious uh, natives of the island, the others, we know them. And I'm so excited. Yeah, this is awesome. Jin tries asking Sawyer instead, because Anna Lucia said he, he's not allowed. But Sawyer's also not super into the idea. He says Michael won't come back without Walt, but he probably won't find him anyway. And he says it's every man for himself. And of course, he calls Jin Chewy in the process, which he has called him before, right? Yes, he has. And it is such an accurate nickname. <laughs> the non-English speaking yet very important sidekick <laughs> who everyone has to try and pretend they understand. Actually, no, they, they fully understand Chewie. Like, Solo understands Chewie, doesn't he? Yeah. Did you see the Solo movie? Oh, um, no, I haven't seen Solo. I went in with rock bottom expectations and I had a good time. You know, it was a fun movie, but there is an unforgivable scene in it where Han Solo meets Chewie for the first time. And it has been 
firmly established in Star Wars, as you just mentioned, that Chewie speaks Wookiee, Han Solo speaks English, and they understand each other, right? Right. And that is the case in this scene, except for a part where the actor who plays Han Solo, I can't remember the kid's name. It's it's not Harrison Ford, obviously. It's a, it's a younger version of him. He starts going in an attempt to communicate with Chewie. And it's so fucking stupid. I remember I saw it in the cinema with my friend John. Shout out to John. And I just, when that happened, I just hear, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> in all these sci-fi movies and TV shows, it's, you know, it's an obvious question of, how do aliens and shit speak English or at least understand it? And all these movies and whatever, they always get around it by, you know, someone has a universal translator implanted into their neck or something like that. It's always something hackneyed and tropey like that. Yeah. Doctor Who. My favorite take on it is in the movie, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where everybody, well, maybe not everybody, I'm not sure, but the main character, what's his name? Arthur Dent. He has a fish called the Babel fish slipped into his ear. And the Babel fish takes all sounds, all language, and translates it into whatever its host understands. <laughs> nice. And it's just a fish that lives in the liquid in his ear, seemingly. And that's cool and novel. Reference to the Tower of Babel, I guess, or Babel, however you pronounce that. I'm not 100% sure, but there is a language learning course called Babel. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident its symbol is a fish. The Tower of Babel is like a biblical story where uh, basically where God put all the languages for humans to get or some weird shit like that. So it's probably a reference to that. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, And the language learning uh, company Babel do not have a fish as their logo. I'm so misremembering that. We are not sponsored by Babel, the uh, language app. Not yet. More of a pair of Duolingo lads, personally. So he calls him Chewy, and then Sawyer says he's got to look out for numero uno. But Jin is having none of this shit. And I guess this pretty much proves Michael right about, you know, what he considers friendships. Jin really wants to go after him, and Sawyer's like, nah, fuck that. Yeah. So again, Sawyer's wishes. Jin tries to leave, and Mr. Echo tries to shop him. And Jin shows everyone his massive pair of fucking nads by punching Echo on the face. And Echo, like, literally on the fucking rebound. It's like he takes the energy from Jin's punch and swings it back around and headbutts the cunt for his trouble. But Jin is also a hard cunt because he will not back down. He gets up, he squares up to Echo, who finally just just got knocked the fuck down from a headbutt. And he don't care. Jin just gets back up like this man. Is, he is locked and loaded. He don't care. What a tank. And Echo concedes. He's like, all right, uh, I know when I've been had. And he lets Jin pass. But then he points him in the right direction. He points him that way. He says toward them. Again, referring to the others. And he gives him another one of his artisanal fucking homemade death sticks. Uh, this is just like a fucking homemade hockey stick. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's supposed to be like a scythe, right? But you're right. It does look like a hockey stick. I don't know. Scythe implies blade. There's nothing sharp about this. This is something you use to clean the fucking gutters he's got, you know? True. Yeah, there's like a rock on it that's sort of been like whittled to be pointy. But yeah, you're right. Not necessarily sharp. It's blunt as fuck. Anna Lucia asks Echo what the fuck he's doing. Echo says he's going to help Jin. Anna Lucia says they can't wait for him. And Echo says he doesn't expect them to. And uh, my theory here is that Echo Loki probably doesn't want to be the token black guy on the island. And that's why he wants to go over after Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So the two of them march off at the jungle and Mr. Echo marches right into our hearts. This is the moment, I think, where you're like, yeah. He's 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 the big chief, this dude. Echo's a real one. Absolutely. We're back with Sun, who's talking to, of all people, Hurley about her missing ring. Ooh. You mentioned this earlier. You, you reckon it feels very shoehorned. Let's let's summarize what happens here, and then you can give me more thoughts if you have them. So Hurley tells her to retrace her steps. Sun says she picked some fruit with Shannon so they could feed Vincent, and Hurley's going to have to stop her right there. Has she considered that maybe the ring will soon be emerging from another ring? Aha, uh-huh. very clever. <laughs> That's how he puts it. Bingo. This is terrible because wedding ring don't slip off. Although then again, I guess if she lost it, it had to have slipped off. So it, it's it's definitely a stretch. But nonetheless, we cut to them closely guarding Vincent's arsehole. Hurley makes some awkward small talk asking if Seoul is in the good Korea or the bad Korea. It's not a great question to ask, but at, you know she's not going to call him out on it. She knows what he means. Funny enough, I uh, I was asked that about Ireland before in 
similar wording. Like I was setting uh, up a bank account when I was in Sweden, right? And the lady asked me, and I think like, obviously because it was relevant whether or not I was from the EU or not, but the way she phrased it is like, are you from, uh, she didn't have like the best English. So I think she was trying to look forward. She's like, are you from uh, the good Ireland or the bad Ireland? <laughs> the that's... bad one being the one that's not in Europe, I guess. <laughs> that is so shit that Northern Ireland gets referred to as the bad Ireland. Yeah, like... I mean, I, I don't agree with that, uh, you know, that characterization. I just I just did think it was funny, though, you know. Nah, Northern Ireland's fucking lovely. Yeah, I, I lived there for five months. It was deep pandemic, so, you know, I didn't get to experience it properly. But lovely part of the world. Mm-hmm. Occupied Indeed. counties. <laughs> 26 plus six equals one. Sun says she's from the good Korea. Hurley asks if she went to the Olympics. Speaking of rings. Sun questions what the fuck they're even doing there. <laughs> and then Chan says, and I have to quote this just because it made me laugh Please, out loud. By all means. <laughs> the dog did not eat my ring. <laughs> uh, like a fair fucking 12 year olds. I, I thought you were going to recite like the little monologue that Hurley gives here or the duologue or whatever you want to call it. But the little speech he gives about Buster. But no, you just wanted to say the dog did not eat my ring. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Again, for the uninitiated, uh, ring in Ireland is a word for your arsehole. Hurley counters with an anecdote, like you said, about how his dog did a great impression of a slot machine one day in that he crapped out about a buck 35 in nickels after eating some change. There's something about the way he says that. Buster craps out a buck 35 in nickels. Like, that is just so funny the way he says it. He's got this big, like, expectant grin, but Son says nothing. Um, he gave know. that joke a lot less than it deserved. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, and seeing as the big talk clearly isn't working for her, Hurley goes back to the small talk. Did you ever have a dog? And so lightens up at this. Uh, she remembers the puppy that Jin got her. Popo. Popo. That inspires a flashback where Son and her old lady are getting out of a fancy ass car and her mother is instructing her on proper blind date etiquette. And they meet some lady who I'm guessing like, is the matchmaker, right? Who begins to tell Son all about this fucking hotel magnate's heir who'd be boring the fucking tits off her today. As they enter the sole gateway to meet this fucking rube, we hear a familiar voice welcoming them and bent over, his face completely obscured by his dashing top hat, is Jin. Doorman Jin. That's not a bad uniform now, I gotta say. Nah, he's looking very dapper. So we cut to the most awkward fucking blind date of all time. Son is sitting across the table from this pretty handsome baldy fella uh, while their mothers sit next to them discussing how impressive each of their respective children are. Ooh, he went to Harvard. Ooh, he went, she went to, I don't know, University of Seoul. I can't remember exactly. Seoul National University. There you go. There you go. Apparently uh, quite prestigious as well, according to this lady. The matchmaker, who is also there, proposes that they make things less awkward by removing the mammies from the equation. And after the ladies leave, there's this brief, awkward silence before Son's date reveals himself to actually be pretty sound. Yeah, he's not bad, all right. Yeah, he's saying he's been pressured just like her, you know, by his father via his mother. She says the same. He's quite charming. And the tension is broken and he makes Son smile. They discuss their studies, the other academic careers, uh, not careers, their academic lives, studies, whatever. And she makes him laugh. And... The writers have kind of pulled the rug out from under us here because things seem to be going well and they both express this. And, you know, we're sort of led to believe like, oh, this is this is where it'll happen with Jin. But then this date goes well and it's a nice little, uh, you know, uh, playing with our expectations. Is it going to pay off? Let's find out. We're back with Jin and Mr. Echo. We're traipsing through the jungle. We love an old traips. Uh, They stop in this clearing and they hear the crunch of leaves. And Jin bolts towards the source of the sound and Echo sort of unsuccessfully tries to stop him. He's like, no, 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 don't do that. Jin emerges in another clearing, eyes darting around before he gets fucking capsized by a boar who must be uh, freshly migrated into that valley, right? (laughs) Closely followed by Locke, probably. (laughs) Mickey in his hands. (laughs) With a horn, like a fucking ship's mast. So Jin sort of tumbles down this this hill. It's, It's kind of gradual incline. It's not super steep. But he lands at the bottom, he gets his bearings, he sits up, and he's startled by a nearby fucking dead body. It's got flies buzzing around it. The body is a man, he's wearing rags that are blood-soaked, and it's got this big fuck-off steak sticking right out of his chest. Yeah, like this big fucking spiky pole, like a fucking telephone pole sticking out. Yeah, it's fuck. It's pretty gnarly. Echo emerges from the bush, and he spots the body, and he tells Jin the man's name was Goodwin. And I'm guessing this is the scene that triggered all those memories for you. It absolutely is, because it links back to Libby's comment earlier on about having trust issues. 
-hmm. And you, you can already, even with just this little information, you can piece together what happened because we've seen this before with yeah. the survivors. But we'll get into it in a couple of episodes. Uh -huh. time. Let's just say they had an Ethan among their ranks. Okay, that just kind of gives it away. But, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but his name was Goodwin. Goodwin. Yeah, and, and, and Jin is able to kind of put two and two together here because yeah. this is a dead motherfucker, but they're not making any effort to bury him. No. So Jin thinks others. Yeah, he points it at the ass. Others. He's left as a warning. And Echo nods with a look of clear disgust on his face, you know, when Jin asks. He confirms it and he's like, yeah. First girl I ever asked on a date. Last name was Goodwin. No way. Protestant, though. Shout out to her. I, I say that in a negative way. I asked her out on a date. <laughs> I was like 14. <laughs> we never went on a single date ever. She sent uh, me a text and was like, yeah, I, I don't really want to do this. And I was like, all right, fine, whatever. Classic Protestants. Yeah. Always saying they don't want to do this. That's, that's why they invented divorce. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, look look who's come crawling back to them now. <laughs> so later, the boys are traipsing once again, and Mr. Echo finds some eucalyptus. He breaks off a sprig, and he offers it to Jin for his cut. Aloe vera. Do you know what I love here? And I only noticed it in this episode. Jin still has the fucking handcuff. Yes, great detail. From all the way, like, I want to say, like, episode four or some shit of season yeah. one. Like, he's had that a long time. Really early season one. So they stop for a chat and, you know, to drink a bit of water and stuff. And Mr. Echo, he sees Jin's wedding ring and he asks him if he has a wife. And Jin, in what I'm going to call his first real English conversational exchange, goes, yes, you? <laughs> <laughs> well done, my man. A plus, right? You know, <laughs> broken play. English is better than no English. Yeah, he's 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 really catching on here. Echo hilariously and oddly replies, "Worse." What? Is, okay, so hang on. What the fuck is this about? Okay, so just to clarify, Jin says, "Like, do you have a wife?" And Echo says, "Worse." What? <laughs> so he's not saying he was married. He's not saying he wasn't married. He's saying instead of a wife, he had worse. What does that mean? Curious. And I don't even remember like like what this refers to. Do you? I like I remember Echo's backstory. Yeah, me too. Quite well, actually, com like compared to other people's. But but this doesn't seem to apply to anything I know about him. He's married to the smoke monster. Well, well, no. So will we spoil Echo's backstory a little bit? Because I have an idea. Yeah, I do. He's a priest. Mm hmm. And he's witnessed some horrific shit in his time. Yeah. So priest has a vow of chastity and also swear to never take a wife or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So he's married to God. Yeah, that is worse. And how, yeah, especially if God is able to allow such evil to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what he's getting at. Yeah, although to be fair, Echo is not actually a priest until he gets to the island. So even then, who the fuck makes him a priest on the island? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows what the fuck he's talking about? Anyway. He asks Jin his wife's name. He confirms that she was on the plane. And we cut to the woman herself, son, and she's digging around in the garden for her ring. But there's absolutely no sign of it. And son starts ripping up crops in frustration before breaking down crying. And out of fucking nowhere, as he's wont to do, Johnny Locke shows up <laughs> with a classic Locke entrance. Bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't help but think we're missing like a sit, like a canned laughter and woos here. Yeah. You know I mean? This would be a great scene for if Lost was a sitcom. <laughs> and I couldn't remember the resolution of this uh, wedding ring episode, but I immediately had the thought like, if anyone has some fucking jungle man method of finding this bloody ring, it's fucking John Zerlock, right? Yeah. Either he either that or Saeed will fucking fasten a metal detector out of uh out of the washing machine in the hatch, you know. <laughs> Which I'm sure he could actually. Probably. He's probably got enough shit in there. Jin is like Tony Stark on this island. He, like give him a fucking box spring, Sa a few Saeed, staples, and a straw. And he'll, you know, craft together a fucking gun if you wanted him to. Saeed, you mean? He said Jin. Did I say Jin? Yeah. Oh well Jin's fairly handy himself now, but he's not Saeed. Jin's the Tony Stark of fishing. <laughs> uh, Locke offers Son a, he stresses, clean handkerchief. And he sits down beside her. Freshly washed by uh, Rosemary. Oh, man, it's all connected. See, they know what they're doing. Uh, the dad jokes keep coming. You know, Locke is really good at, at 
consoling people who are upset and, and, and lightening the situation. Yeah, bringing a bit of levity to it. Yeah. Son asks, did you see me? He says, rip apart your garden? No, no, no. no and she, like, no. she she genuinely laughs through the tears. Like it's, it's, it's Hurley it's couldn't get her to laugh. Yeah. And he's the funny guy on the island. Yeah. And, but, you know, Locke has his mo- Locke's a lot wittier than Hurley. Yeah. Hurley's funny. Locke is witty. So, yeah, like I said, the dad just keep coming. And so does the fucking sage empathy and advice. You know, we've seen Locke do this before. He's good at it. Son comments that she's never seen Johnny Locke angry before. And Locke laughs at that. And he refers her to his flashback episode, saying he used to get angry and frustrated all the time. And Son asks, are you not frustrated anymore? And he says, I'm not lost oh. anymore. Then he looks at the camera and says, I'm prison break. Sunday is nine on Fox. <laughs> so son asks how he got not lost anymore to badly phrase a sentence. And he says he stopped looking and <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a messy metaphor here. And so is confused. So she decides to have a flashback. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't know what else to fucking do. Yeah. So. so we see son at a restaurant. She's checking herself out in this pocket mirror and her dining companion has yet to arrive. And we cut to outside where fucking Conti McDickface from the job interview is leaving the building. What a prick. Yeah, fuck him. Jin opens the door and he bids him farewell and your man doesn't so much as fucking glance at him, of course. And suddenly our baldy mate from the blind date earlier shows up. He pulls up in this dope-ass open-top sports car and Jin runs over to let him out. Do we ever want to refer to this guy by his name? Yeah, well, we learn right here his name is Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Jin wishes him a good afternoon. And Mr. Lee asks if he can borrow the flower on Jin's lapel for his date. Jin obliges, and Mr. Lee asks his name, respectfully thanking Jin, uh, Mr. Kwan, after he gives it to him. So can I say, I actually got in trouble for this exact situation in work once upon a time. Go on. Do tell. Literally the exact same situation. Owner of the hotel came in, was attending a function in the hotel, came up to me and asked me if he could borrow my cufflinks. And then I got in trouble by my manager later because I didn't have a button on my cu- on my cufflinks, like or on my cuffs. They were just held together by the cufflinks. So I had to kind of tug the sleeves of my suit down further to hide the sleeves of my shirt, which were actually slightly longer. And she was like, "You know, what do you do with a cuff? Like tie that shit." And I'm like, "No, y- your man had to borrow them." And she was like, "All right, okay, yeah, same situation." Lost based on Ado's life. I love it. Based on true events. But yeah, yeah, I guess I guess it is. Uh, important to know because I don't think I did before but uh, Mr. Lee's family does own this chain of hotels right he's like the heir to this it fucking... has been stated yes uh, but he's a uh, he's a nice bloke he's down to earth Jin seems like genuinely touched by his kindness and by the respect shown to him by this by this man uh, in, in stark contrast to that interview prick we cut to the middle of Mr. Lee and son's date uh, and he's finishing a wacky anecdote about being locked out of his hotel room wearing a towel Son notes that he's surprisingly normal for someone so filthy rich. And he tells her he likes her too. And then he proposes they go steady, you know, make it official to get their the folks off their backs. And then proceeds to wreck the illusion completely by telling Son that she is a front. Mr. Lee has in fact met an American woman while he was attending Harvard. And they're getting married in six months time. Oh, this man can fuck off because he was leading me along in this episode. Right? Son seems like really upset about being led on and Mr. Lee like stupidly has no idea that she was actually oh, into it. Oh, what a thick cunt. I'm sorry, but he didn't. No, he made absolutely no indication no, that this 100%. was anything other than genuine interest in Son, but no, apparently not. So she tries to deny it. You know, she tries to play along. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I never expected anything. You know, I'm, I'm totally on your side and then the old fucking spunk trumpet from the interview approaches their table and he asks if there's anything they need and despite the inherent problems with the hierarchy in general here it is nice to see this prick in service to someone above his stature Do you was know that I mean? the same prick yes it was did we not see him leave the hotel earlier uh yeah although there has been a time jump so maybe he came back in maybe he was just off for a, a fag or something <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's a cigarette to our international listeners. Yes. Yeah. Don't cancel us, please. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Not over that. <laughs> yeah. So he offers them. He's like, do you want any dessert or anything like that? They kind of get you anything. They refuse. And Sun says, oh, do you know what? I got to leave. Just remember to have an appointment. So I got to bounce. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for lunch. She maintains her friendly facade. But as she walks away, we can see that she's visibly upset. Right. Now, I'm going to ask a very vague question because I, I don't want to spoil this. 
but we know that Sun has more history with Mr. Lee, right? Does that yeah. take place after this or during all of this? I have very vague memories of this. I definitely remember this actor being in it again, which is very welcome. He's very charismatic. He's a, he's a lovely man. He's a good actor. I have a feeling, although I can't be 100% certain on this memory, I have a feeling that we get more flashbacks where he's helping her with her plan to run away to America. Right. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, so it has to happen after this. I think so, yeah. I think right. him and his American wife are sort of in on it. Uh, is he helping her run away, or is he just teaching her the English? Oh, he might be teaching her the English. That could be it. I know he definitely teaches her the English, because there's a scene. Yeah. It's like the third time they meet up, and he's like, you know, why don't we just have this conversation in English? You've basically been fluent for three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. I know I didn't want to spoil it, but that's the entire... <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, man, we remembered together. So we're back with our new favorite duo, who I'll henceforth refer to as Gin Echo. It's Gin and Echo. They're through, through the jungle. Echo picks up a trail, and folks, we have yet another fucking tracker in our ranks. How many, how many fucking trans-Pacific flights do you think take place every day where there are three experienced trackers on board? Yeah, but I don't know. Tracking is this ability that the writers have quite lazily given to certain characters <laughs> yeah, to yeah. allow them to do a certain thing you, that you said others have to rely on them for. I know, I've gone on a whole rant on it before. Check out season one, episode whatever. Well, that's that's why I'm pointing it out. Like they've decided to bestow it on on yet another person, and it's it's not it's not incredibly believable. That can't be that common a skill that three people on one fucking flight would have it. Although, I don't know if you're going to Australia, maybe there's a higher likelihood because you know bush trips or whatever. But you know, I'm, I'm even then that doesn't apply to these characters. So I don't know why I'm trying to defend it. Yeah, no idea. Jin asks if it's Michael's track, and Echo confirms, adding, "quote." They don't leave tracks. Again, all these cryptic references to this fucking group of people, right? I like, I actually don't know how I feel about this. It This worked really well at the time the show came out. But later on, we do learn a lot more about the others that demystifies them a bit. Yeah, a little bit. Fucking others. How do they work? There's nothing really all that special about them. <laughs> <laughs> but it is intriguing as fuck for now, like you say. But speaking of demystifying them, there's... This next bit I find really interesting. Yeah. So they follow the tracks into this clearing where we hear another twig snap and the music gets very tense here. And we get what I think I've referred to in the past as the Avengers cam sort of circling around Mr. Echo. And when Jin tries to speak, (laughs) Echo covers his mouth with a hand that's about two thirds the size of Jin's (laughs) fucking face. Like coaching him. The size of his (laughs) concerns. And we cut to the camera then. This is weird. Like, it's a weirdly done sequence for uh, for Lost. He hushes him. He, like, intensely turns around. There's a close-up on his face. Shh. And then yeah. we cut to this, like, quiet shot of the brush. And we cut again, and the camera's slowly creeping through the underbrush. No sound accompaniment, but that of the jungle wildlife. Until it finally lands once again on Echo and Jin, who are, like, hiding in a bush. Yeah. Sort of like a lower ditch under a bunch of shrubbery. And I mean, like we said, shit must be fucking serious if the echo chamber is carry- is cowering. Oh, you know? love it. But this is like they're huddled up pretty tight in there. But in fairness to them, no, they are fairly well hidden. I wouldn't have spotted them. No, 100%. We put their uh, hiding skills to the test here because we get a reverse shot from their point of view. It's a nondescript patch of jungle floor. A beat passes on Jin's obscured face again. Before we're back to our reverse shot, and suddenly we see someone's legs walk by. They're barefoot. They're wearing filthy, raggedy trousers. Yeah. These are followed by another pair of barefooted legs. We cut back to the shot of Jin and Echo as several more mystery people walk by. Easily about, what, 10 people in total? Ah, uh, I didn't think it was that many. At least seven. Seriously, I would have said like four. No, no, this is a this is a long line of them. But did you notice anything about the footage of them walking? Uh, I do have a goof in the trivia, but you can go ahead if you noticed it. There's something about it. It's like it's shot at a different frame rate or something like that. And, and I feel like I always watched this scene and it always stood out to me. Like them walking is done at like a slightly ho- a slightly lower frame rate, I think, to give it like that jittery feel to it, to make them feel otherworldly. That that's always been my headcanon here. Interesting. I didn't notice this at all. 
But uh, yeah, interesting. I'll, I'll have a look out for it next it time. It may not be true at all. It could just be whatever type of camera they needed to use for that low down shot or something like that that gives this effect. But mm-hmm. it always made the footage of their feet moving feel a bit weird. And because I feel weird watching it, and these are the others, like we've never seen the others before outside of Ethan and Dead Goodwin, right? I feel like it had to be deliberate deliberate whatever it was they did with the footage i'm not sure but i can't wait yeah. to hear what your goof is later on yeah well the goof is nothing to do with what you just said but uh yeah. <laughs> one of them's wearing a pair of air jordans <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine taking up the rear of this crew is a smaller pair of legs with a teddy bear hanging from a string behind this can person. you please not refer to a child as taking it up the rear please <laughs> oh dear i mean if you're gonna cancel us for anything there's there's some good <laughs> ammo Camera lingers on the bear. We cut back to the lads. There's a bewildered look in Jin's eyes. I guess we should point out that the others are all like barefoot. They look very tribal, for lack of a better word. You know, like savages, kind of. That is exactly what they're going for in, yeah. in the show, what the creators are going for. We cut to a short time later where Mr. Echo slowly emerges from the bush, followed by Jin. Both of them scanning the area to make sure the coast is clear. And Jin immediately wants to go in the direction of the others. And he says, Michael. Uh, but Echo stops him again, saying that the others don't have Michael. And Jin probably doesn't understand what Echo says, but he trusts him by now. He trusts him to know what he's talking about by now, basically. He's less sort of gung-ho. He'll listen to what Echo says. He just saved his ass, you know? Yeah. Echo points in the direction of Michael's trail and says that Michael likely narrowly missed the... His lucky, lucky escape. You go back, says Jin. Now, I go. Ha- now hang on. If I had spent 43 days after crash landing on an island in South Korea, I would not have learned that much Korean. The way Jin is able to structure that sentence. Yeah. You go back. I go. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it it sounds so simple to us because we're native speakers, but that's actually not that simple to put together. Yeah, there's a there's construct sentence construction is very important tenses and all that kind of stuff you right know, like and uh, verb subject object all that yeah yeah it's a it's an impressive level of skill so yeah jin says he'll go echo refuses to go back again insisting that they stick together we get a flashback and we're back at the soul gateway hotel jin opens the door for a couple of lads who are entering after which sun leaves immediately without looking at him and we're pretty much right where we left off in the last flashback right she's coming out she's wearing the same dress as when uh mr lee told her that she was just a front and suddenly a man and his son approach Jin and they're dressed in a way that indicates their lower social stature right yeah and the boy is fucking dancing on the spot and the man asks Jin if his young lad can use the jacks and we expect Jin here based on everything the sort of subtle references to him being ashamed of his working class past and the whole don't let people like you in we sort of expect him or at least i did to be tossed into this battle with his principles and priorities here right Mm -hmm. i thought we were being set up for this sort of dilemma and jin pushes back a little bit at first he says hotel guests only he suggests a bathroom down the street and he asks the sprog if he can hold it in but the lad shakes his head and then jin just caves and lets them in i don't know this this felt i mean we could talk about what happens after but this felt a little bit flat for me i don't know about you i i kind of expected more of a dramatic sort of decision making process here do you know what i mean yeah uh, there's not a whole lot of decision making to be made um this is a, again an exact situation i've been put in before being the do- doorman once upon a time for a big fancy five star hotel and you were explicitly told to not let certain kind of people in. And they're referred to as undesirables. Yeah, the riffraff. And what they generally mean by that here in Dublin is don't let the junkies in, right? Uh, yeah, basically, the, hell he is. the homeless drug users, uh, people begging for change, things like that. Even if even if they come up to hotel guests who are just standing outside the hotel, it's like, have you turned your own for the boss? You have to kind of go over to them, stand in between the guests and them and say, listen, sorry, you need to move along. You have yeah. to, You have to do that. And it, it's fucking gut wrenching. So when someone comes up and they're like, "Can I use the toilet?" I am happy to get sacked over something like this. I'm one hundred percent in Jin's <laughs> corner because you, use of the toilet should not be a privilege. It's a human right. I agree. I I just wanted this scene to be more. I think. Do you know what I mean? 
I feel like it was a bit of a wasted opportunity. I don't really know what I would change about it, but I don't know. Like Daniel Day Kim could have stretched his acting muscles here. We could have explored his inner turmoil. Maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm wanting too much here. I, I think maybe you are because think what are the stakes? I mean, he could lose his job. That those are the stakes, right? But I just feel like the way they set it up before, where he's like, "I'm just the son of a fisherman," or "Don't let people like you in." Like, I don't know. I just, I just wanted more of a a dramatic bend to the decision. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. Jin lets him in. He directs him to the jacks, and he asks him to be quick. But even as he's opening the door, we see it happening from an over the shoulder shot of a looming presence. Yeah, Mr. Kim is his name. Jin's Mr. boss. Mr. Kim. Yeah, fuck that dude. The working class man is is very thankful. He shakes Jin's hand. He's completely forgotten about his son's apparent emergency, right? But Jin is like fucking steady on right. him, you know? <laughs> like hurry up. And Mr. Wangstein immediately comes out the door and gives Jin a formal warning for letting the boys in. Uh, he tells Jin, you know, the kid can fucking piss in the gutter for all I care. Which is a dickhead comment on his own. But he then goes on to say shit like, you people are used to that. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, but fuck right off from whence you came. Yeah, this is this is horrific. And he orders Jin to go in after them and get them out. Yeah, which is weird. Oh, hell no. I'm the horse you rode in on, buddy. <laughs> I think he'd see it in Jin's face. Like, he wants to deck this man so bad. But instead, he does the bigger thing. He, he's the bigger man. He begins removing his gloves, and he fucking quits on the spot with his principles intact and his dignity regained. And most of the uniform's still on his back. That's theft right there. <laughs> exactly. And I guess maybe this is where I wanted this to go. I think as much as I approve of Jin's actions here, I think maybe it would have served the drama better if he had turned these people away. You know, it represents his beginning of the turn towards denying who he is. He gets this redemptive scene with his father, and we've seen in a previous episode, right? But where did that start? I feel like this was a good opportunity to show the start of that, to, to make these flashbacks have a point. It all feels very pointless to me. Like I said, they set up this thing with the inner conflict with his working class background, and then they don't really go anywhere with it. Do you understand? I feel like if this was a much longer episode, they could have given Jin the chance to turn this man away, wrestle with the decision, and then come back and make good on it somehow later in the episode. But they only have so much time to work with, so they've just wrapped it all up and skipped the middleman. I don't know. I think I feel like they could have uh, made Jin turn him away, and it gets a little bit, you know, tense. Like the the let's let, let's say I'm rewriting the scene right. Jin says I can't. At first he's sympathetic. He's like, listen, I can't. I'll lose my job. The man's like, you know, I'm writing on the spot here. But the man is like, dude, please, we need to get in. Like it's an emergency. And Jin says, we don't let people like you in here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Think about that, right? That's like self-flagellating. That's him sacrificing himself at the altar of this greater fucking evil that he's. You know, it sets him on the path where he ends up working for Mr. Pike, being it's a fixer. Self betrayal. Exactly. Don't don't you think that would be would have been a better use of this opportunity? Absolutely. Had they more time to explore that? Yeah, I'm I'm disappointed in Darlton. I feel like they could have done it in the time it took for this scene. And then, like you see, he looks over and you see the fucking cunt who interviewed him nodding his smug approval. You know what I mean? You're like, and even Jin is like, ugh, I don't feel good about this. And you know? maybe in the same scene, upon seeing smug look realizes what he's doing and then says, you know what? No, get in there. Second door on the left. Maybe. Maybe. If, I don't like, know. Like just to constrain it within the time limit, right? I'm very conscious of time. I would like it as one. I think he could fit into one scene and I would like it better as the start of his downfall. But however, that's not what we got. We cut back to Sun, who's sitting on the beach again, staring out at the water, and Kate approaches her and she sits down beside her. She consoles her on her lost ring, which she's heard about. Sun says that she's trying to convince herself that she shouldn't be so sad about it, you know, because it's only a thing. And Kay picks up what she's laying down and she begins to reassure her, saying, listen, they've only been gone a few days. And Sun cuts her off. She says, cut it out. I'm fucking sick of everyone saying Jin is all right because he's not all right. And she tells Kate that Claire found the message bottle, as we saw in the last episode. Kate asks where it is and Sun tells her that she buried it. So now that brings the total number of people who know about this up to four. Correct numbers. God fucking damn it. <laughs> we cut to the tailies, sans Gineco. 
uh, with Sawyer taking up the rear and he looks fucking beat and he stops and he sits on the ground. And this is where I realized like why he's been so sleepy all episode because his bullet wound is probably giving him <laughs> yeah. some grief. His shit's probably getting infected. Anna Lucia comes over and gives him some water, but she also threatens to leave him behind because she can't do a nice deed, you know, without canceling it out. Sawyer calls her bluff, though, because uh, he says she can't find his camp without Sawyer or without Echo, her tracker. Mm-hmm. And Anna Lucia, you know, she she tries to play confident. She's like, yeah, we can cross the island and hug the coast. We'll find it. And then she also says, and besides, Echo's coming back. And then Sawyer, out of nowhere, asks if Anna Lucia is married. And she's confused, but come on, it's kind of been a theme in the episode. Anna Lucia, get with the program. Uh, she says she's not married, to which Sawyer replies, too bad, you seem suited for it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could see it going there straight away. I guess it's kind of like a boomer, you know, wife bad joke, right? <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> and she sarcastically retorts, funny, then asks if he's married. No, ma'am, he says. And then she asks if he's gay. Funny, he replies, and then gets up and moves on. I guess we, we'd already like this scene in, in the year of our Lord 2022, right? It's a bit dated. It's a bit fucking schoolyard, joshing. Yeah, it. I mean, it is, but it's harmless enough. No, I'm not saying it's like super problematic or anything, but it's just a bit of an eye roll at this stage, you know? Yeah. it's uh, Comedy has moved on. Back with Gineco, the boys come to a stream. They stop for a drink. Echo tells Jin that he lost the trail. And instructs Jin to wait by the stream while he goes back to find it. Don't really know how you can lose a trail like that and then pick it up again. But anyway, fucking tracking. How does it work? Uh, surprisingly, Jin obliges. But we quickly learned that he only stayed behind at the stream so he could wash his hair. I just want Mr. Echo to see him do it. Yeah, he just wants to, you know, freshen up them locks. You know what I mean? Powder his nose. A figure emerges across the stream and says, what are you doing? And Jin looks up to see fucking Michael. Michael! <laughs> Michael tells him to go back Jin says his name Michael stresses it again Go back man uh, And then he runs off And Jin hesitates for just a minute He's thinking Should I go back and get Echo? And then he's like Nah that's my boy right there He starts to give chase We cut to Michael Running through the jungle Calling Walt's name Cross off your fucking bingo card There you go And uh, Jin is in tow Calling Michael's name Michael turns around Tells Jin to fuck off again Saying he's not going back without Walt And and then Michael decides to scream Walt into a waterfall to see if that helps. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that'll do something. Jin hushes him. He's learned now. With, he's been with Echo. You know, he knows the lay of the land now. Mike doubles down on the loudness and demands the others take him instead. Well, he doesn't say instead. He just says, take me. Like, he doesn't care how he gets to Walt. He just wants to get to the same place Walt's at. Or I guess he could just be saying, fucking fight me, bro. Take me. Echo shows up suddenly. And he tells Michael that he doesn't recommend shouting. (laughs) And then he insists that Michael come back with them. And Michael obviously refuses. And he raises his stick threateningly. And then Echo fucking turns on the empathy here. He says he understands the pain. But he tells Michael he has no what others are capable of. They won't be found if they don't want to be. Again, setting up like this otherworldly ability on their part. They are not just human. They are part of the forest. They will only appear to those that they want to appear to. Michael gets emotional and he says once again that he's not going back without Walt. And Echo decides to break out the big guns here and he hits him with a warm, comforting, empathetic look. (laughs) Did you you notice this? Like (laughs) Michael's just like, I'm not going back without him. And Echo just kind of gives him a look, which is super effective. (laughs) It works. Yeah, it disarms him. Michael begins to settle down. Jin puts a hand on his shoulder and says, you find Walt, Michael. And again, how good has this English gotten in the space of this episode? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like his English is almost too good at this point. Yeah, because no one's giving him English lessons. Like he's been hearing a lot of English, but that's not enough. You need to be able to be taught what the words mean and how to parse them together. Yeah, this is serious exposure. He's picking up a language like a child would their first language. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What I love is that in the transcript here where it says, uh, Jin says, you find Walt, Michael. Next to it in brackets is the intention here is you will find Walt, but you need to come with us now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I got that. <laughs> Right, a couple of words missing because <laughs> because if you were just reading this, it's almost as if Jin is egging him on to no. You actually continue, yeah, right? You true, go, true. Yeah, keep it's, up it's, the good search. It's script direction, I guess, rather than <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. 
so Michael nods and he lowers his weapon because he realizes that he's been outmatched by Jin and Echo's weapon, the most powerful weapon of all, friendship. <laughs> Maybe the real tailies are the ones we met along the way. <laughs> I was just about to make the same joke, but about Walt. Walt is the friends we met along the way. <laughs> uh, great minds. Back at the beach, Son and Kate dig up the message bottle. And it was at this point that I realized that that goof you read out last week was not a fucking goof. Or at least, do you do you remember you had a goof in the last episode? Yeah, hi God, it is still kind of a goof. Yeah, because it appears or reappears now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, her Fair ring enough. does disappear quite cleverly, but it also reappears yeah, as well. They were, they were this close to nailing the attention to detail. They, they had one job, up. guys. Yeah, one yeah. fucking job. Seriously, <laughs> these fucking editors, man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we can all see it coming. Kate opens the bottle to remove some of the messages and son goes out Edward Snowden on her ass and she tells her to stop that they're private. But Kate refuses. She's frantically searching. Kate, there's something's up with her. Yeah, there's shenanigans here. Yeah. And son loudly tells her once again, stop. She grabs a message out of her hand and she asks, what's up with you? And Kate confesses that she never got to say goodbye. Bullshit, Kate. We know as well as son that this love triangle still has three sides. She is worried about Sawyer. Now, why are you calling bullshit? That is not why she pulled that letter out. There's something in that letter that she was hoping would go with the boys to the real world that she doesn't want anyone on the island to know. Do you think? I feel like Kate wouldn't have put a letter in there. Because she wouldn't want to alert people to her presence ahead of time. I don't know. She's just being way too fucking shifty here. And this whole made up excuse there, like there's the uh in the middle. Uh, We didn't, uh, I didn't say goodbye. I think that's just her being embarrassed to admit that she's got the hots for Sawyer. If you remember in the finale, there was a moment where she did sort of realize that she didn't get to say goodbye to him. I buy it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. But. We've been fooled by her in the past. I'm skeptical. Fair enough. Son begins to put the messages back in the bottle when Kate starts smiling and nods to the ground and sitting in the sand is Son's wedding ring. Son begins crying with relief and laughing and crying again. Great acting from Yunjin Kim here. Oh, brilliant. Lovely, heartwarming performance. Uh, we cut back to the three best friends where Jin is looking at his own wedding ring, which inspires a flashback. And, uh, you know... Jin has stripped down to his shirt, so his <laughs> his standard issue doorman jacket is probably sitting in a bin somewhere. Uh, presumably. That's been fucked into a garbage can long ago. <laughs> and he walks down a riverside, and a homeless man walks by him, which causes him to ponder as he walks on. Perhaps he's considering a life of charity and dedication to the poor. But that thought immediately goes out the window as a woman in an orange dress walks by. Orange you. Just like Jin's, uh, Jin's homie said. It's in the Destiny the book, man. Hell yeah. Jin turns around to check out that ass before smiling, turning back, and <laughs> bumping right into Sun. She must have had her a juicy peach if he if it got a smile out of him like that. <laughs> her son's bag falls to the ground with all her makeup and fixings going everywhere. Jin helps her, and then they lock eyes, showing that even across the world in Korea, meet cutes can be completely fucking cliche. I know, but it's adorable. And, ah, uh, uh, dude, love it. You like it? I do. I quite like it. As much as I'm not a big fan of the Sun and Jin episodes, their relationship is so cute. I agree. And yet I think that this cliche is, uh, you know, we've talked about this before. The Lost Writers have talked about how sometimes they earn it. This one unearned. Such a such a fucking trope. Uh, I'll speak more about it at the end of the episode when we give our our thoughts. But, uh, you know, we cut back to Sun. She's happy crying on the beach. And we end on this gorgeous shot. I mentioned it at the start of the episode from behind a couple of tree branches. It frames Sun and Kate in the left foreground of the image. The sea stretching out beyond them. Lost. Lost. What you think? I quite liked it. I quite liked certain aspects of it. Jin's flashbacks, not a huge fan of. I liked parts of them, but easily my favorite point of my favorite part of the whole episode was during that final scene of, you know, showing the flashback of Jin and Sun meeting each other and Sun on the beach. Jakino's music. 
Yeah, oh, it is lovely there. It got me. Mm-hmm. It fucking got me. That man knows how to write theme and light yeah. motif like no one, no one else does. There's a reason Pixar go back to him every time. Now he can he can pull on your heartstrings, play your emotions like a fucking orchestra. Yeah. Pun fully intended. Yeah, uh, I thought it was a, a very mediocre episode. As far as lost episodes go, sure. Yeah, our first bad one of the season, our, our worst one of the season so far for sure, because they've all been bangers up until now. I thought. The Gin and Echo stuff was good. I liked that. I liked the drip fed info about the others, but I do find the wheels are spinning a bit on the story. Do you know what I mean? We're really not propelling it forward that much. Again, like I said last week, they do have to fill 20, 20 odd episodes, you know? But the Hurley one felt a lot more like there was some good character development going on. My problem with this one is I thought the flashbacks didn't add much to the plot of Son and Jin as we know them. Sun's ring, oh, the whole thing with her ring just felt like they retrofitted that title for the lost and found. Sorry, they retrofitted that story for the lost and found title. They're like, oh, we have a pun. Now let's, uh, let's do a story around it. Yes, yeah, Sun and Co. and the rest of the survivors are just jogging in place now until the tailies can catch up. Yeah, them. pretty much. Here's what I'll say about the uh, why I felt the meat cute was unearned, right? It was very similar to what I said about Jin's not you know not confronting his his inner conflict with his with his working class status right so i said there that i thought it was a missed opportunity you know that i think he should it should have illustrated the downfall of jin's sort of morality and then he can redeem himself on the island maybe they could have tied it into an island story right where jin uh shows contrasting behavior that would have been fine the sun aspect of it, right? I, I I thought they did a nice thing with subverting our expectations with the blind date going well. And then she fucking walked out of the hotel. When she was walking out of the hotel, you know, I, I guess we were supposed to go, okay, well, this is where her and Jin meet. It's all going to be okay, right? But no, she just breezes right by him. Up until then, it's very interesting. And then to just hit us with a fucking bump into her, drop all her shit, and then lock eyes and immediately fall in love. <laughs> That's fucking weak, dude. That is... They, it, there was so much potential there. That's the thing about this episode, is I feel like they set up a bunch of pins and knocked none of them down. With the Jin's uh, working class, working his way up story, and the Sun Jin meeting. It, was all, it, it all felt very anticlimactic to me. Well, do you know what? That is some great fucking analysis there. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> like you said, it's lost. We love it. I don't mean to sound like a prick. Speaking of sounding like a prick, <laughs> that's, that's not a good segue. But uh, I got a teeny tiny little trivia section to, to take us home. Are you ready for this? Hit me. Let's get to our trivia section. Alrighty. Uh, okay, so like I said, I don't have a lot of trivia. I have about three points of trivia and then a few goofs, right? So the first bit of trivia is the Jin's email, as seen on his employment application or his CV or whatever that thing is, is jinsu 74 at yahoo.com. J-I-N-S-O-O 74. Now we wouldn't be, uh, you know, dedicated lost the plot hosts if we didn't try and send an email to that email address which i did today and i believe we have gotten and you know what i would not have known that you had even sent that email from our account if it wasn't for the fact that it bounced back because that email does not exist non-existent email unfortunately it must have at some point right and it's probably been deactivated due to inactivity i would imagine so which means it's up for grabs oh shit email us lostpot as gmail.com or jinsu74 at yahoo.com i'm just kidding we don't have that don't email us on that please email our actual email address thank you very much kind of a boring trivia point here but there you go this is the first episode of the season not to feature the swan as a location yeah i did notice that it's also absent from the next two episodes abandoned and the other 48 days can't wait uh, it is seen again in Collision, and it goes on to appear in every remaining episode of season two after that. So I feel like they're deliberately leaving it out of three episodes in a row to build up a bit of hunger for it. Yeah, 100%. And it's working, baby. It is strategic. Mr. Ed is a 1960s TV show about a talking horse. 
<laughs> titular Mr. Ed. Another one of, you know, Sawyer's great fucking references. His, his decades-long spread of pop culture references, right? How old is this cunt? It clearly depends on the writer of the episode, what kind of references he makes, right? They range from, like, the 50s to the fucking 90s. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good span. I guess he watched a lot of TV as a kid. I want Sawyer to have his own podcast talking about TV shows. <laughs> Josh Holloway, get at us, bro. You ready for some goofs? Oh, you know I love me a good goof. Okay, so I've got a nice elaborate goof here from Jin's uh, CV, right? So first of all, the CV is obviously mostly in Korean. There is a bit of English in it, right? Or uh, if not English, you know, what would you say? Like his name is written in Western script. I don't know. if Is there a name for our script? The Latin alphabet. Ooh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I knew that. But his name is misspelt on his resume. It says Quan with an A instead of Quan with an O. Oh, goof. Uh, it is spelled correctly in Korean, however. But it's just, and here's a new word that I learned today. It's just transliterated incorrectly. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's a nice, fun and specific word. Transliterated. It's nice. It's got nice, uh, you know, I just, it's a nice sounding word as well. Like It rolls off the tongue. It does. Transliterated. Okay, here's a weird one. Jin's date of birth on his resume reads 27th of November, 1974, after which it says in Korean that he is 30 years old. So it's got his date of birth and it specifies he's 30 years old, right? Which would be impossible because 30 years from 27th of November, 1974, Jin would be on the island. 2004, right? Right. So he has to be younger in this scene. Now, they have done the math. Uh, first of all, he can't have been lying because his date of birth is seen again and confirmed in a later episode, the same date. It's actually on his tombstone. Ooh. Ooh. And that's, you might think that's a spoiler for Jin's death, but not necessarily. No, it's lost. Shit gets weird, okay? <laughs> Uh, so here's a really interesting thing I learned because I never knew this before. I had heard before that in China, the year in the womb is considered a year. So when you were born in China, you're one. As in today, you would be turning 33 in China, right? Interesting. That I knew before. Here's what I learned today. Ages are also calculated differently in Korea. Your age is one sal, S-A-L. Now, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I haven't uh, confirmed it. So when you're born, you are born one sal, and then you turn two sal on January 1st. So for example, you were born the 27th of September to uh, 1990, right? Right. You would be one on that day, and then on January 1st, 1991, you would be two in Korea. Fucking hell. So everyone turns a new age on January 1st. You still have a birthday, but your age and your ID and shit like that doesn't change until January 1st, right? Very interesting. So therefore, he would be 30 years old by Korean standards in 2003. However, it is twice confirmed in later episodes that the Kwans were married in the year 2000, which is four years before the crash, uh, during the year of the dragon, putting these flashbacks at the very latest in 1999, making Jin 25 years old here, or 27 Sal. Oh, that is very interesting. There's a nice elaborate goof for you. It's weird as fuck, but it's very interesting. Yeah, and that, that's fascinating about the, uh, the Sal mm. thing. I did not know that before. Last goof here, and then I have one more small bit of trivia. When Jin and Echo hide from the others, this is, I remember I mentioned this before. Yeah, yeah. Two pairs of lower legs are seen twice. This is the, I think it's clearly a a pair of women's legs. Everything else is trousers, but this woman, you can see her sort of shapely calves, right? Right. Those legs appear twice uh, at the head of the column and just before the child dragging the teddy bear. They're the same pair of legs. Oh, interesting. Twins? Or those people are just walking in a big circle in front of Jin and, (laughs) you know, kind of like a cattle market. (laughs) Parading themselves like they know Jin and Echo are there. They're just like, let's and then, make them think, you know. And then for the last go around, they're like, right, send the teddy bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Them's the goofs. Our la- I couldn't find a really dumb bit of trivia to end with. This one is, uh, it's kind of like one of those weird tenuous connections, but I don't stand by it as one that's going to annoy you. So when Libby asks Michael about his friends, Michael comments that Jin is his friend, but Sawyer isn't. One episode earlier, Sawyer said he wouldn't go anywhere until he knew where his friends were. Michael then appeared and said, so now are your friends. (laughs) 
That's it. It's it's not a good piece of trivia. I'll give you that. But there's uh, a lot of referencing between this friendship relationship between the boys. Yeah, they're they're still hashing it out. They don't even know what they are. Why put mm-hmm. labels on things these days, man? It's 2022. <laughs> Dead right. Or it was 2005 at this time. <laughs> Although that has to be a trivia point. Sawyer mentioning Prison Break. A mere two months. Oh, no, it would have been shot and recorded long before Prison Break came out. Or maybe Prison yeah. Break was being recorded, I was going to say, on a similar studio. No, this was all shot in fucking Hawaii. Mm-hmm. I doubt Prison Break was shot in Hawaii. Do you want a trivia point from me? Uh, fucking always hit me. So... The hotel that Jin works at, which is called the Seoul Gateway. Gateway, yeah. This is a hotel in Hawaii called the Club Wyndham Royal Garden. Yeah. Fun fact. Nice. Yep. I like that. I did read that. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't put it in. <laughs> Wyndham hotels are like this huge fucking chain of hotels. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's one in Hawaii. Funny enough, I've never heard of them before. Wyndham. No, you mean I'm I'm very invested in, in the hotel world. So I guess yeah. so, yeah. But I mean, I know your your Trumps, obviously your Hiltons, your Holiday Inns. It's just it, four seasons, you know. How and ever that wraps up our trivia section and fucking wraps up the episode. Ada, thank you for your time. Happy birthday again! Thank you, listeners, for listening. Uh, you can tweet at Lost the Plot Lads to wish Ada a happy birthday if you want, even though it'll be several months late at this stage when you're hearing it. Thank you, nonetheless. Or you can tweet at us about anything else, Lost related or otherwise, at Lost the Plot Lads. You can also find us at that handle on Twitter, on TikTok. Please give us an email, lostplotlads.gmail.com. Give us some content to read out for the second half of the season. And hey, share it with a friend who likes Lost or a friend who doesn't. We'd really appreciate that too. Do, do it as a birthday present for, for your boy, Edo. Aww. That'll do it from us here today. But before we go, Edo. What's your theory this week, birthday boy? Great question. My theory this week is that because Michael was the one who put the handcuff on Jin, Jin is still wearing it as a friendship bracelet. Oh, see, that's the kind of, that's kind of, we need more positive trivia points like that. Not that negative shit I'm always slinging. Yeah. We heard it here first, folks. Thanks again for listening. That's it from us. And remember, you haven't lost anything till you've lost the plot. Good night. Lost the Plot is produced by me and Edo. The artwork is by Jimmy Purcell of binbettercomic.com. The music is by Noel Brennan of No Exit. You can check out No Exit wherever you stream your music. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Lost Plot Lads. And you can email us at lostplotlads at gmail.